before uh, starting, I would like uh, to uh, welcome, uh, to thank, uh, sorry, the Gallery Futura and Catherine Koch uh, for uh, hosting us today as part of the exhibition uh, Tukunsland 2099. Uh, you can uh, see uh, the installation here uh, from uh, Superfiliale uh, with works uh, from Michaela Hindal. Uh, but the main point of the exhibition is actually uh, bus tours uh, through uh, Kreutberg, uh, Berlin Utopian Tours, uh, which are conceived and uh, led by uh, Michaela, uh, who is uh, here. Uh, thank you for being here. <coughs> Where are the window? Because I'm kind of uh, a <laughs> creator. <laughs> uh, and this leads me to uh, thank uh, warmly the three artists uh, uh, who accepted uh, to take up the invitation and participate uh, in this talk uh, by uh, giving insights uh, in their works and their processes uh, on the question uh, relating to the topic. Uh, of uh, speculation, simulation, and utopia in art. And uh, so, as I said, uh, Mikata Hildindal uh, is an artist uh, who is uh, based in Berlin, uh, coming uh, from Denmark. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's a term for mixing. Uh, Gosha Lehmann, uh, who is a filmmaker and an artist uh, originally from Poland, also based in Berlin, uh, and Valerian Gloss, a uh, designer uh, also based uh, in Berlin. Whereas the pre-modern uh, era was concerned uh, with uh, the preservation of a divine order uh, inherited from the past into the present, uh, uh, the modern era is of course uh, characterized by a new consciousness uh, of the future. And this uh, consciousness of the future uh, is, um, goes in hand, uh, according to the Sun uh, with the, the advance of technical progress uh, and capitalistic society, uh, when for the first time people get a sense that the future is going to look uh, very different uh, from the past. Uh, and this, of course, is part of a, a more broader um, transformation or paradigmatic shift or turn uh, in Western uh, thinking, uh, which is uh, the advent, as, as the Enlightenment uh, coins it, the, the advent of a new rationality of an enlightened mind uh, thinking. Um, and um, as much as um, uh, this develops uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, uh, we can see that it kind of developed into uh, a full, um, let's say, rationalization uh, of the future. And uh, if I follow this in culture, uh, indeed, uh, he sees uh, also here uh, the, the effect of um, technical breakthrough also from the beginning of the 20th century, which, are, which have to do with uh, the, 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 the development of new energies, uh, starting perhaps uh, with electricity and uh, going on uh, to uh, uh, what we know uh, today. Um, and this is also throughout the 20th century that uh, future studies as a scientific discipline uh, emerge. Uh, and as far as they're concerned, and if I uh, sum it up in a very broad way, uh, we could say that there are perhaps three moments, uh, or three chronological moments of future studies, uh, which still uh, today overlap, of course. Uh, uh, the first moment uh, of uh, future studies uh, is what we call uh, forecasting, uh, so it's the idea of making uh, predictions about the future based on uh, data, so that is based on, on, on the past, let's say, uh, uh, which is extrapolated uh, into the future, so the data uh, is extra extrapolated sorry, uh, into the future. Uh, the second moment of uh, future studies is what uh, we call uh, foresight, uh, uh, which is more humble as to uh, its uh, prediction about the future and uh, the prime method being used is that of scenarios so it's the idea of developing a few different uh, uh, scenarios and uh, from then on uh, uh, find strategical way to uh, go to these uh, different uh, futures uh, those two modes uh, uh, of the future uh, have in common that they try to find orientation um, through uh, those different uh, means uh, for the future and they also have in common that they uh, that the future, let's say, is uh, enclosed, uh, is closed. Uh. And um, contrary to those uh, two strands, uh, there is uh, another strand of future studies, actually broadly it would be perhaps critical future, it would be called 
crit critical future studies. Uh, and what I'm interested in uh, is a specific aspect of it, uh, which is the, the, the think of the future as a process uh, in the making. And uh, this um, concept or this orientation or this trend, I would say, uh, differentiates itself in the sense that the future is open uh, and uh, it's not so much about finding orientation uh, for the future, but it's about uh, reopening, let's say, the possibility space or reopening uh, the different possibilities for the future. And this is, of course, when uh, speculative motive, um, methods uh, are useful because they have uh, reopening uh, the future. And the second uh, very important difference is that uh, it's not about, like in the first two strands, finding way to orient ourselves uh, for the future, but it's using those images of the future for the present in order to uh, deepen our understanding uh, of the present. And indeed, in this trend of future studies, uh, the idea is that the, the present contains already seeds of, for the future. And they talk about latence, in that case, uh, as um, uh, realities that haven't emerged uh, so that we would see them and call them as events. Uh, so underneath, let's say, realities uh, that are uh, maturing, that haven't uh, uh, been, yeah, that ha aren't visible, let's say, uh, yet. Uh, and um, uh, among those, I mean, uh, as an example, uh, of course, we can take, uh, unfortunately, uh, the example of uh, climate change. Uh, so, of course, now we start seeing uh, the effect of climate change, but we know that it hasn't started uh, from today, and we have no clue, probably, as to when uh, it started, but perhaps uh, we talk about uh, 100 years ago, whatever, whatever. So it's a good example of, uh, of something that was longer latent and now is uh, emerging. Uh, other type of latents are, for instance, uh, disposition, what is called dispositions. Uh, uh, and a disposition is that of sugar, for instance, to melt into water. So things that are here in potential, uh, about things, about living entities, uh, whatever, uh, that uh, have to be triggered in order to be uh, actualized uh, and can be triggered or not. Uh. And of course, beyond the sugar melting into water, uh, the dispositions that are uh, most interesting are these, I find, is, are these of uh, individuals uh, as well as groups and as societies uh, for change, for becoming uh, different. Uh. Um, Voilà, so it's, uh, it's uh, this kind of uh, strand of uh, future studies uh, uh, which uh, concerns me and actually uh, if, that is the, if that is so, that's because uh, I think that uh, with such an understanding of, future, of, a, of a concept of future, uh, we reopen uh, possibilities, social and political possibilities. Uh, whereas uh, with the two other strands, uh, we are pretty much uh, in, the, in some kind of a dictat of a future seen only as a fixed target in, time, in a future time space. Uh, and by doing this, uh, we go along, I would say, uh, the dictate of the techno-economical complex, uh, which indeed uh, tries to, um, tries to uh, dictate its ideologies of the future and also tries uh, to take positions of advantages in the future, uh, colonizing, let's say, uh, the future. So we have to kind of uh, decolonize uh, the future. Something you need to know about the future is that very, very soon, in 2020, uh, the streets of Berlin will be in a riot. Uh, hundreds and thousands will protest against a massive sellout of communal, social, and cultural spaces. The main offices of the big commercial real estate companies, they will be occupied, and their estate will be repossessed by urban activists. The monument that you are able to look at now is somewhere here, approximately. Uh, it will be erected in 2025 
by the Chinese artist duo Li and Li, Long Di Xiang, they are also known as. Uh, it will be placed uh, at a space that was once known as the Kuvri Brava. It's quite close to here, it's around the corner. In the 2000 series years, it was planned to build social housing there due to urgent housing shortages in Berlin. Instead though, in 2019, that is the year that you are in right now, a shopping mall and an office building was being erected, the so-called Couvre campus. From the artist statement of Nom de Manson, we can read, the dark matter sculpture stands for the many social and cultural spaces that were swallowed up and eradicated by speculative profit makers in the early 21st century. The form and the texture refers to intergalactic black holes that suck up the energy and bodies of stellar elements and cross them, or at best, transport them to unknown locations. December 2025. 2025. Um, that is shortly after the riots. Um, 
the urban reposition riots, in which the different citizens' initiatives, such as Kochi and Co, that are currently working very hard around the Columbus tour to create a new political framework uh, to minimize the rent increases. They gather up with um, the activists from Lausse 10 and 11, uh, who have been fighting very hard since last year, where they found out that the big activists, artists, uh, building that they are working in, have been working in for the past 20 years, is put on sale uh, by Tekka's real estate company for 20 million euros, although it was bought not very long ago for only 3 million euros of the Berlin municipalities, because Berlin's municipalities were in financial trouble some years ago. Also, their, their uh, analysis of the future was that due to demographic changes, there would not be any need for new housing in Berlin in 2019. It turned out to not quite <laughs> be correct. Are there any... Oh, sorry. And this is, this is uh, in 2020. This is where these different initiatives, um, along with Kunstbra, uh, and a uh, coalition of artists working currently in 2019 uh, with the different uh, artistic interventions in public space. So, uh, Katja and Co., Laos 10 and 11, and Kunstblock, along with Princess Ingram, they form a coalition of uh, citizens' activists that become the leading, uh, uh, leading organization in uh, carrying out the urban activist repossessions of the 2020 years. This is really the most important thing going on at that moment. There is a version I already said that my topic is catastrophic simulations. So the way how we um, simulate in preparing for disasters for the worst case moment. So this was what I was researching in and trying to find narratives and stories and artifacts. So I will say we start a bit by the beginning. Maybe you, whenever you research a bit about disasters, you find this thing actually. It's this for earthquake, which is like in the middle of the 18th century, like one of the events in Europe which completely shaped the whole continent, which had that a huge immense impact on the whole history which is coming, uh, which followed. Uh, before disasters were, what disaster and catastrophe was not like this thing how we use it today. Disasters were very local and not always affected you on the other side of the planet. So it was not as well. Like, when something, some volcano erupts 2,000 kilometers away, you most likely won't hear much about it. Maybe you will, of course, there's influence on you, but it was not one collective thing that the whole world was shaping. And this one earthquake somehow it changed a bit. There was a lot of artists, a lot of writers wrote about it. It was well known on the whole continent. It changed the way how we think about religion, politics, how we building cities even. So there was a lot of things happening suddenly. It was, became a part of this collective memory. And probably because of there is that because the narrative was very easy to narrate, it was very easy to talk about that the whole city was destroyed by an earthquake and then tsunami and became was such a big thing that it became part of the <coughs> so These narratives I was very interested in the beginning of my research for these narratives that are working and making a disaster. This is actually <laughs> this nice quote from Max Frisch from a book which is called Man and Policy. I can recommend it's about uh, I don't know what it's about, but uh, the quote is very interesting. It's, Said only a human being can recognize catastrophes provided they survive them. Nature recognizes some catastrophes. This means only the human who will tell the story about the disaster creates the disaster. And this also makes it so difficult to say what is disaster actually. A financial crisis can be a disaster, like a tsunami can be a disaster. It's a bit, a bit strange that those things which are really far away from each other are uh, recognized as a disaster. Because we can tell stories about it, we can, we can talk about it. 
And um, one of my most favorite things when I could work with one more and more interested in was the research a lot of in this theory part was the uh, war games, the way of um, how we simulating wars or how military simulating those worst case scenarios, which also Hermann Kahn comes in he was making a lot of this um, think thinking about the scenarios and shape the scenarios. And it's actually what all those militaries are also doing bigger scales and larger scale and smaller scales to uh, make the strategic simulation and the flaws often with computers, with board games, with pen and paper, but also very often very real. And um, I wanted to make be a bit um, take a bit kind of part of one of those um, uh, war games. And we have actually the opportunity to do that. There's a company called Optronic and um, they um, provide, they can apply there and they can make you a civilian on the battlefield. <laughs> and um, you can take part of an ar real army exercise. So you're going to uh, mostly at the uh, Soviet Bavaria, it's a really, really huge army um, exercise field on the biggest in Europe, and you're playing for a certain amount of days a civilian. What you're playing basically is a scenario, you can also check it out, it's so spectacularly interesting. So NATO has different kinds of scenarios, they follow in for their war games. And one of the most recent ones is the so-called Skullkan scenario. And the Skullkan scenario is um, that they're uh, like a corporation or like a kind of NATO, but from different enemy countries. And those enemy countries, they're doing weird, red like things sometimes. Sometimes they're making invasions, sometimes they need help. So you're making, so they're really making up a whole story around this, these countries. They have history, they have weapons, like they have um, Flags, they have politicians, they have, so there's a whole uh, NATO headquarters busy with this scenario making. And, uh, based on what you need, they're kind of adapting the scenario. And in our case, it was that Skolkan is attacking the rest of the NATO countries. And uh, no Skolkan is the kind of the equivalent of like Skolkan. But this, yeah, there's different countries, and it's, it's fake countries, they're not existing. They're not existing. There isn't there like a dislocation because of this people are kind of part of NATO, so they kind of hijack those places. Um, and this and this like kind of when you think about it, the scenario was that the East attacks the West, and so the Russians, but totally not Russians, <laughs> the Russians attacking the West. <laughs> this is the scenario. It's an officially official scenario. Of course, the Russians don't like that, and so at the same time they're making also kind of a little army exercise. It was called Safa in Russia, the East West. So, kind of, we had, like, so they, they're making a bit this, 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 this simulation fight and they're doing it at the same time. But while the West is a bit more secretive about this, we can obviously not talk too much about the stuff I did there. But the Russians invited journalists and the whole world basically to watch them testing the newest weapon systems as a different philosophy how to deal with those scenarios. So, then the whole thing is actually, yeah. It's kind of strange to talk, but I just try to comprehend it a bit because it's, it's, it's really like you're seeing this place and you have this, this color around all the time, like this, this it's kind of a remote control. So the, weapon, the soldiers have to deal weapons, but with blank bullets, when they're shooting, they shoot like a laser tumor and it hits you, you're dead. Then you have to play dead. So this is the key, key component of the whole scenario. When you, when you hit, you have to lie on the ground. And it's also get really like primitive to get out of the role. So there's all the time people watching you, there's all the time drones, there's cameras, snipers in the forest. So it's you're all the time surrounded in surveillance and you have to stay in this, this role. And it's actually a bit irritating. Uh, did some people have issues with staying in the role? Yeah. Yeah? Do yeah? you know like about central experience experiment? Was it kind of connectable to that? Do what? Uh, central experience. experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, but the thing is, you never really know if it's true or not. It's, it's, it's a really stand. We had like this one guy, you see this ghost policeman? They were like a man, but it just was like, that was that. We had a Dutch army with us, and they had like a meeting there to test a little reporting on it. And this two, this, the police guys got really, like, really wild. They got really much into their roles. Wait, like the police were actually civilians? Yeah, yeah. The police was just civilians were selected to play police guys. Yeah, yeah, so they were like. <laughs> but what I found actually in this way, this is where. Also, where your question comes to hand, is this reality and simulations leaking to each other, where you can know any more of its simulation or reality. And that actually happens quite a lot in history, that simulations become reality. For example, you have the Chernobyl disasters, you all know, 
was happening through, through, uh, through uh, training exercises. So they made a training, and one of the training programs failed, and then shit happens, as you know. Also, the first Apollo mission was similar. It was a training exercise, there was a, a, a fire inside the capsule on Earth, and uh, the pilot died. And this is, um, it showed that there's some trainings, you can never be sure. It's like, Coming gravity. And that's also, I think, with this war games kind of a weird shit that when you see the Russians and NATO they're doing at the same time their trainings and battling each other with propaganda, mm -hmm. kind of a bit afraid how, how what, what could happen out of it. This is what the work that I am dealing later with in the Martin and Frontier project, and also the further project about uh, further research in my theory of what happens in these scenarios for a while, but what does it mean for us? Those mm -hmm. Maybe the last thing I want to just show. And about the blue is kind of thing which kind of maybe explains this kind of really okay. From Louis Borges, the, the excellent of science, a really nice short story. Russia short <laughs> And it's about a, a king who wants to have a map from his country. And he wants to have the map as detailed as possible so that in the end the map becomes the country itself. Because it becomes so detailed and so rich. And it's a kind of my experience also with this military simulation itself that they become easy very so real and so good that they become a disaster it's so remember this this copy of the video I want to finish yeah <laughs> I'm open for questions but maybe we will send it later so I think John will do that yeah mm -hmm. thank you Thank you. 
be about how fiction is being constructed and how it links to reality, so sort of also the topic that Valeran works with, like it's not much work together even, so maybe that's why I have a research so I'm waking up, so <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to link all this, um, um, all this like artifacts from the past to filmmaking and this like methods of storytelling. So in a film, you've got um, film props and Hitchcock points at him MacGuffins for the narrow black like, plot devices, so the objects that are um, they don't have necessarily any kind of you know narrative around them, but they push the whole story or plot of the film forward. So similar to the museum artifacts, like we mostly haven't seen you know Mona Lisa or whatever, like any kind of proofs of like maybe Mona Lisa, for example, but like something of um, a bigger proof of the history that we all believe in. It exists somehow collectively in our consciousness and it kind of pushes also the narrative of the story forward. So that's like how kind of past pushes present. And um, yeah, so it's same in the cinema that when you have these objects that just say like, don't don't carry the narrative value themselves, but they just push the story forward like yeah, this is one of these is Falcon is like a classic example where the whole crime story goes around like um, something, but you don't know what it is, and then there's this Matthias of Falcon, and you don't see it until the very last scene of the film, and you still don't know what actually it is, and why is it so valuable. Or uh, Holy Grail, this is also like a pretty great example, because it's also in the reality, when you in the medieval had the legends of people holding and looking for the Holy Grail, which is this like, non-existing object, but also in the films, like the most likes the law, uh, Indiana Jones, you have it always, that there was this pursuit of this impossible object. So I also use this um, MacGuffins in this film, like this performance, this um, impossible archive. So I created objects that don't have necessary purpose or meaning, but their meaning or value is up to your speculation. They somehow relate to the story that has been told during this podcast. This is the uh, statistical probability tarot cards to tell the future based on this like, statistical jargon. Like when you have the futurists, they actually work also sometimes similarly. Archaeologists both are based on the speculations, both influence uh, presence. And in case of futurists, it's like more, yeah, the materials is like statistics, so kind of to predict the future. And sometimes the predictions are not always the most accurate, and so, but like, it's like kind of compared to tarot cards, let's say. Or like the empty cabinets of uh, museum. Um, yeah, there's your cabinets where the objects has been removed and you only have the outline left after a long time or something being there but you don't know what it is and you have to speculate about it so again it's the same proof of the absence and so So yeah, just to sum it nicely up, it's like if a man defines situation as real, the real and the consequences, that's Thomas' theorem, it's um, so if a child is scared of the ghost Maybe the ghost is fictional, but the fear is real. And so the suspension of disbelief that comes from the from the fiction also kind of interacts in reality in many different uh, situations and and kind of pushes our own real narrative forward. <coughs> so just to finish that, to connect it to contemporary society and the preemptive um, tendencies that we have. So it's like yeah, also as Isabel mentioned. We have like a lot of futurologists and people who are working to just tell what's going to happen in the future, but also this trend searching into like easy solutions in the capitalistic context and so. So preemptive um, relates to the things that can be um, that are just kind of suggested for us beforehand before even we know about it. So um, this is like the presence is shaped by the future. So the presence is not actually the consequence of like long ongoing past. It's not that the past is like pushing itself like kind of to the presence. It's more that the wishes or desires of um, some imaginary or speculative things are actually driving us forward. It's not that you know like I don't know Leonardo da Vinci kind of came up with uh, or forestalled times. It's more that everyone wanted to have it, so it somehow happened at some point, and it's not. It's like foretelling of the future. It's just more that everyone just like walks towards that. Like everyone wants to, like not everyone, but like in mainstream culture, like majority is working towards that because of like some political or economical reasons. So yeah, that's just like uh, the concept actually comes from Flusser, but this is I think the nice sentence from Armin Avanesian who works a lot with this concept of uh, preemptive society. 
And uh, besides, like, like he gives just examples like, to explain this preemptiveness and um, preemptive tendencies. Like on one hand, it's like the algorithmic um, suggestions, like you know, Amazon that knows about the book that you don't know yet, but you don't sure. like it, and you're gonna read it, and actually gives you suggestions that are very accurate, like more and more, <coughs> or like something that you, um, for instance, here like. I don't know, all your friends playing the same track that you didn't share it with them yet and you wonder like, oh, that's like kind of weird but you're getting used to it and more and more because of the YouTube suggestions or Spotify and so on but also besides the commercial context, it could be like in political like uh, in case of decentralized wars when actually it's not the same situation as like Cold War when you have very clear enemies like fighting each other but you don't know who's the enemy, so you kind of want to see who's going to react towards that, and that's kind of also the part of its preemptions, and um, yeah, just to be uh, one step ahead from the future. So I'm ending up with a green screen, because white page would be too political perhaps, <laughs> and green screen is maybe easier to associate with like something much more abstract, and yeah, so um, I would just like to get up not to go further because I think I will talk for like another hour or something, but yeah. Uh, so the unknowns frighten us. To fight it for some is like seeking to be uh, one step ahead through decisions based on predictions. Perhaps that's why the preemptive model seems so attractive. To sum it up, we do, using the trendy almost cliche expression, design the future by starting our by stating our desires within the speculations. So the question is always about the lack of awareness or wrong intentions that can, with incredible ease, turn a utopia into a dystopia. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <So that's it. laughs>